Um, I am so delighted to be here. I've got to tell you, um, I, I travel in my ruby red slippers from Kansas. Um, I didn't wear them today. I've known Renzi for about five years, I think, and I am just so excited about all of the fabulous work that Overcome has been able to do. Um, uh, she asked me to come and participate in this conference, and I said yes immediately, and she told me that I could pick my topic. And so this is the topic that I chose, and um, as I go through it, hopefully you'll see why. So these are my disclosures. I'm an advisory board member for Overcome, Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance, and a Foundation for Women's Cancer, grant funding, and the Speakers Bureau member. Most importantly, the opinions here, expressed here, are my own. So I want to review racial health disparities in ovarian cancer care between black and white women in the US. I'm using terms black to mean people of African descent and white to mean people of European descent. Um, these terms are very simplistic, uh, but they are used um, by governments and by uh, different people to track statistics. And so I will use those terms. I'm going to discuss factors that are associated with disparities in ovarian cancer care that are beyond the racial and ethnic disparities. And I really would like to spend a little bit of time discussing strategies to overcome disparities in care. So of all the forms of injustice, of the, all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. This was, um, uh, this is a quote from uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1960s, um, who was really talking about the fact that there are differences that are unequal in how people receive health care, and it changes health outcomes. What we've heard this morning, what we heard this morning is amazing, isn't it? Yes. It is amazing. It is incredible, all the advances that we've made in ovarian cancer care. We've increased genetic testing and interventions that are actually preventing women from developing ovarian cancer in the first place. So Dr. Sood showed that slide where the incidence is going down. We have so many more options for women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Many more treatment options, nuances in how you undergo surgery and what kind of chemotherapy and now immunotherapy and targeted therapy. The news is that women diagnosed with ovarian cancer are living longer. This is amazing. This we celebrate and there, and that is just unbelievable. We've made differences in strides in prevention, diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, palliative care, end of life care, all along the spectrum. But I've got to tell you that even with this, we are not doing as well as we can in all populations. What we know is that ovarian cancer is far more common in white women than in black women. Overall, the risk of developing ovarian cancer in women is about a 1 in 78 chance, except in those women who have a predisposition from family history or genetic uh, predisposition. But black women have worse outcomes, 30 to 40% lower chance of surviving. But what I want to tell you is that evidence suggests that equal care leads to equal outcomes. So if you're getting the same level of care, your chance of survival is equal. Unfortunately, black women are diagnosed at later stages of disease. They're less likely to receive the standard of care we've been talking about, including surgery and chemotherapy that Dr. Kamat just talked about. And as a result, black women are less likely to survive. If we look at what Dr. Sood showed earlier, this is a difficult slide to see, but I just want you to focus on cancer, is the second leading cause of death for men and women in the United States. So um, the rates of cancer beyond ovarian cancer, the chances of dying from cancer are higher if you're black or African American in the United States than if you're white or Caucasian. So this is for all leading causes of death, in fact, but cancer is the second leading cause. 
What we know is that what contributes to this is that black patients across the board, not just those who have ovarian cancer, are less likely to receive appropriate cardiac medication, less likely to undergo bypass surgery, more likely be, to be diagnosed with late stage breast cancer and ovarian cancer, more likely to receive lower quality of basic clinical services such as intensive care. So this was published by the um, Institute of Medicine National Academies in 2003, and since then people have been trying to understand some of the reasons why. And I've got to say that there's, in addition to these startling statistics, there's an excess cost to the health system and to our society. So if you look at this, at the very top, the cost analysis, you can see at the very top that there's higher health care costs that we bear in the United States. Uh, higher health care costs and excess burden with higher disease prevalence leads to health disparities. But if you look at the costs of care variation, some people are getting a certain level of care and others are not. That leads to health care disparity. So some people are not receiving good quality care. Some people are not even getting care. And then if you look at populations, these are the social determinants of health and environmental determinants of health. And there's a lot of research going on right now looking at that. Maybe you don't understand the reason for care. Maybe you can't travel for care, you can't pay for care. Or maybe you don't believe that care is going to help. And so these are things that we really need to unpack and sort out to make a difference in ovarian cancer care and survival. So um, the National Academies published this in 2003. I talked about this right now, but their document was called Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. And what I want to be really clear about is that we're in an era of personalized medicine. And so these two things can occur at the same time. You can have differences in care, and that's the very top part here. This is what we're talking about at the very top part when we talk about personalized medicine. Is this treatment appropriate for you as an individual patient? Do you have a BRCA mutated tumor or a BRCA wild type tumor? There are differences. Those are clinically appropriate differences in making what we need to decide in partnership with you what is the best treatment for you. That is not disparity. Disparity is what I just talked about in that big kind of pyramid or stair step, is that the ecology, the environment of the healthcare system, and also discrimination, bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty. That's disparity, and if we can reduce disparities, we can improve care for all. So there are some systemic factors, environmental factors. We talked about a little bit with uh, Dr. Kamat, talked about who is going to be your doctor. About 50% of women in the United States are not getting cared for by specialists who take care of women who have ovarian cancer. So is that because they don't have access to these doctors? It's geography, where they live. Maybe it's an inner city urban hospital that doesn't have enough gynecologic oncologists, or maybe they're living in rural Kansas, the state of Kansas. There's some counties where there are fewer than 300 people who live in the county, okay? So it's maybe geography, and how do we overcome that? By partnering with specialized regional referral centers so that you know that there's a place that you can connect with if you're diagnosed with ovarian cancer in any of these areas that don't have the specialists. You could be at a low volume hospital or low catchment area in that geography. And then what's been going on this week in Washington is lots of doctors have flown in, cancer physicians and scientists has, have flown into Washington and are testifying and are talking to our politicians about insurance policies. For instance, Medicaid doesn't adequately cover clinical trials. We have to change these insurance policies or some insurance policies don't adequately cover clinical trials. So if we have trials that are testing new treatments that could improve ovarian cancer care and you have the type of insurance that won't cover it, that's a problem, okay? And then there's financial toxicities at the cost of care. And these are areas we can work on. Physician factors, if you have a low volume surgeon or we know they're low volume surgeons, 
you either partner with regional centers or you teach them how to do these surgeries. If you're a non-gynecologic oncology specialist, you need to refer out. You don't need to do an ovarian cancer surgery if you're not specialized in that area. And then this area that we don't like to, like to talk about as physicians is that sometimes we are biased in our clinical decision making, okay? Um, so I think it's important, and we're starting to do this in our national conferences, is incorporating health disparities, health inequity into our national meetings and into our research. And it's so important for us to train a more diverse workforce. I go to high schools and I go to middle schools and I get in front of sixth graders and I say, what does a surgeon look like? Does a surgeon look like me? And they kind of look and they're like, well, I don't know. But I wear my scrubs and they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm in my scrubs. But what does a scientist look like? And so we're trying to train a more diverse workforce so we can inform this and encourage participation in clinical trials. Then from a patient standpoint, it's hard. You may not have enough insurance or education or income. We need to develop programs and programs such as overcare that, is, that help people through their treatment. There are also patient factors such as fear. So we need to increase awareness and education and provide support for peer support during treatment. And then there is mistrust of the medical establishment, and we have to acknowledge that as medical professionals. Lots of people don't trust doctors like they used to, right? And so we have to increase culturally appropriate programming and reach out to people and let people know that we're listening to them, we hear them, and how can we meet you halfway to make sure you get the care you need. So I'm gonna go through a few stereotypes. So in, in our field, there are stereotypes about what a pelvic mass is in a black woman, okay? People think it's just a fibroid. And fibroids are very common. These are benign tumors that happen in the uterus. You have abnormal bleeding, you have a pelvic mass, your black woman is fibroid. So we need to educate physicians and healthcare providers about the workup of ovarian cancer. It could be a fibroid, but it could be cancer. There's common folklore that BRCA mutations are not common amongst black women, and that is not true. There are BRCA mutations that occur in all populations, including amongst black women, so we have to educate. And there is a myth that black women are not willing to undergo surgery or chemotherapy. So sometimes they're not offered it. So we have to increase awareness and education about underlying reasons why if somebody doesn't want treatment when you initially propose it to them, and educate communities about the importance of treatment and making a difference in ovarian cancer survival. So I'm gonna talk about a few patient stereotypes, and if you've heard this, you can just raise your hand a little bit. When air hits it, it will spread. Who's heard that? Okay, there we go. A couple of black women raise their hands. I know. When air hits it, it will spread, okay? So we have to acknowledge. So just as I have to acknowledge when I'm sitting with a patient, I have to acknowledge Dr. Google. Dr. Google? Okay? I acknowledge Dr. Google is in the room with me. I have to acknowledge Uncle Fred or Aunt Sue. Okay, because there is knowledge that comes in with the patient that I must acknowledge and start there, but then also educate about the importance that surgery makes in the survival for ovarian cancer. We just heard about this all morning and from Dr. Kamat. Surgery, if you're eligible for it, makes a difference in survival. Cancer, the word cancer is a death sentence, right? So a lot of families don't even want to talk about it. They don't want to say the C word, right? People have heard that. So we've got to educate communities. What I hear a lot is my faith alone will heal me or I won't claim it. So I worked in Nashville, Tennessee for a long time. Who, who knows about claiming things? Okay, okay, so there's a few black women in the audience. All right, okay, we're not going to church right now, but okay, so but you've got to understand when somebody is telling you this, 
you need to understand this there's, there's some deep cultural lore that we have to unpack so that we get people the care they need and it's important to work with church communities to understand what that means so i've worked with some pastors who say well you say you know god gave me the brain and the education and the hands and the skill to help you. So there's some language we can incorporate in if that's the faith that the person is talking about. Then people don't trust doctors. And this goes beyond the black community. I talked about that, mistrust in the medical establishment, or you don't want to be a guinea pig, so you don't want to enter into a clinical trial. We have a lot of work to do in the medical establishment to train physicians and healthcare workers to increase trust. And guess what? The burden is on us, okay? The burden is on us to get people to trust us. And why is this so important at an ovarian cancer conference? Because ovarian cancer advocates and survivors push the medical establishment because what did they say? What are women telling doctors every day? I have symptoms, right? I have symptoms, and who is listening, right? Do you hear that every day? So we have to increase trust to make a difference in this disease. We need a partnership between the physician and the patient so the physician comes in with a level of expertise, medical and surgical skill and knowledge that we have earned, okay? But we also have lived experiences. We have experiences that we bring into the room. The patient has expertise. The patient has self-knowledge, and we need to acknowledge that. The patient knows her body, and also a lived experience. Sometimes the physician and the patient have shared lived experiences culturally, uh, but you don't have to have that. You know, you just have to be able to establish that partnership. And if you're able to do that cross culturally, you're going to make a big difference in care for all women. So I've got to say, as I'm closing down or winding down, that the number one thing we have to do is listen to women. Okay, ovarian cancer is not silent. We have to listen, right? We need to understand that more funds are needed for ovarian cancer care and ovarian cancer research. We need to educate our physicians and healthcare providers to look carefully, listen carefully, take a detailed history, and perform appropriate exams and tests. We need to tell our population teach women about symptoms, the beach symptoms we've been talking about today, right? Learn about your family history. And um, I've got to say that this is such an important topic uh, for me personally and professionally because it's the right thing to do, eliminating health disparities and inequities in ovarian cancer care and cancer care is important. It's the right thing to do. But sometimes I have to convince the people that I work with that it also makes economic sense. If you're diagnosing a group of people later and later in the course of their disease, the cost of care is far greater than if you diagnosed it early. So even if you don't believe it's the right thing to do, it's gonna impact your wallet. And in fact, there are hospitals that are looking at this, social determinants of health, and they're becoming interested in health disparities. Why? Insurance companies are becoming interested in this. Why? Healthcare costs in the United States are, it's estimated between 2017 and 2021, $1.3 trillion with a T. And consumers, our health insurance, what we're paying out is going up and up and up. So if we don't make a difference in, in kind of figuring out a way to provide sensible care to people, it's gonna be a problem. But I would also argue that if we can better educate our communities and our physicians and our healthcare workers about how to give culturally appropriate, personalized, individualized, compassionate care, to everybody, it makes care better for all. And I really would love to thank Overcome 
for talking about access to care, for helping women who are underserved receive care, for raising awareness, for being strong advocates, for providing research funding for advances. I do believe together we can overcome ovarian cancer disparities, not only locally, but globally. Thank you.